Hi, and welcome to another fabulous episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, a podcast dedicated to helping you live a thyroid healthy lifestyle. We're so glad to be back with you again. I'm Dana Bowman. And I'm Jenny Mahar. We are the dynamic duo behind Thyroid Refresh and Thyroid 30. And we are so thrilled to be here today with Deborah Atkinson of Flipping 50 to talk about staying active as we age. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I love you guys. Love your message and what what you do. And it fits right in with my hormone balancing babes. (laughs) We are all on this shared mission. We're, we have um, gotten more deeply connected with Deborah recently as we um, uh, rolled out some amazing new workout videos that you created for us. So, um, any members on the site need to check those out. Deborah is just incredible and knows her stuff. So, very and before we get started and before we roll into all this amazing talk we're going to have, this girl talk we're going to have, I uh, wanted to share wellness coach and fitness expert Deborah Atkinson has helped 150,000 women flip their second half with the vitality and energy they want. She's the author of You Still Got It, Girl, the After 50 Fitness Formula for Women Navigating Fitness After 50 and Hot Not Bothered. Ooh, I like that. Deborah hosts the Flipping 50 and Flipping 50 podcast, Uh, and she's a frequent speaker and expert recognized by AARP, Washington Post, Prevention Magazine, and US Today, and we, USA Today, and we are so glad to have you. Thanks so much, Deborah. Thank you. Well, I know this is going to be a great show because we already kind of got into this juicy conversation before we got on the air about how amazing you look and how much we appreciate having those role models as we age as women, those people we look up to and think, that's how I want to be. How do I do that? How do I manifest that sort of health and radiance and glow and well-being in my life? And, you know, we were talking about how our life choices really radiate from us more and, and reflect more from us as we age. So we're so thrilled to be here with you to glean from you, uh, your philosophy and your methods. So talk to us about how the needs of our bodies change as we age. How does your routine look different now than it did say in your twenties and thirties? Oh my gosh. Volume is so much lower. (laughs) The intensity the intensity is different, but the one major thing is volume is so much lower. So, and let's take into account, this is my 35th year in fitness. And, you know, as a grad student, so finished my, my undergrad degree, I was out for about a year when I realized, you know, it's so much safer in school. I'm going back to school. And uh, so I went back to grad school and as a part of my assistantship, in the department of kinesiology, I was teaching classes. I was working for our exercise clinic, which was widely nationally renowned at Iowa State University. But my job was to teach exercise classes three days a week or four days a week, I'm sorry, both in the morning and at night. So number one, right there, academically, we weren't even recognizing that that would be a little much, you know, and then, then what does a fitness instructor and in a, in a fitness junkie do, but goes to teach part-time somewhere else in addition to that. So I spent many years, decades, teaching and exercising multiple hours a day. That was the norm. And, you know, now it's minutes, minutes a day right? Is the real, you know, every day, all day, because I'm just as busy as anybody else. But ironically, I've learned that that's the best way to exercise. Being busy can actually save you from yourself if you love exercise, or you have that idea that I have to do more to burn more calories. Just not true. Mm. And you know, it's so, it's so interesting how our, our whole life is kind of built around that. When you say, you know, multiple hours, you you're not you don't mean just two. I mean, you mean I mean you're you're 23, 24, 25 and you're teaching four, five, six hours a day. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is just yeah. 
every day and maybe you take time every off and, you don't, and you loved it and it was great and you loved it. But now thinking back about how uh, depleting <laughs> that might have been for your, you know, later years, yeah. it's just it's incredible. And, and it's, it's really great that we've, we've come this far. I feel exhausted just thinking about that. Yeah. I love this new <laughs> shift towards shorter workouts and less yeah. is more in many cases. Yeah. yeah. You know, now I think we forget that your body is always sending you clues and signals and signs whether this is really working or not. And the whole purpose of exercise was and is now has always been to feel better and make our activities of daily living easier. So if you're finding yourself needing caffeine or sugar more when you're exercising, that's a sign that you're, you're, you need to get up, you need something to make it go. Or if you're on the couch, both of those are signs that this is not a good fit. We need to relook at this. Mm. It, it seems especially important to thyroid patients as well, um, many of whom are also autoimmune patients and dealing yeah. with hormonal issues and things like adrenal dysfunction. You know, can you tell us a little bit about how that can be, those things can be worsened or maybe flare ups caused yeah. by overdoing it? Oh yeah. And you know, what I would say to anybody is that, you know, if you've got thyroid issues and especially an autoimmune issue, what you're showing us is really an amplified version of probably what's happening for the general population. It's just, you've got a more narrow road to drive down. You, you don't have the wiggle room. Somebody else does. So you're not alone. But when you're pushing yourself to extremes, you know, the adrenaline and, you know, we love that rush, but unfortunately it's really short lived, you know, and so one of the keys is always, if you feel like after a workout, you could lay down and take a nap, it's too much. And it may be that one isolated session was too much, but it could generally and probably tends to more often be your, your weekly load is just too much. And, and it's always relative to whatever else is going on. So we sometimes don't take into account stress, you know, and figure just my emotional, my financial, my work stress is also, that's a workout for your body. And we have to factor that in. So the exercise you do should complement, not compete with it. And we don't, we don't plow through. We create a plan and then we ideally, we work the plan, but we have to do that with flexibility so that if you've got projects do at work. Your, your kids have extra projects at school and you're helping them out or you're doing lots of driving. That may mean you've got to fluctuate and you've got to be flexible and good to yourself to choose exercise that's at a level, at a duration, or at an intensity that makes sense. So maybe that means cutting everything by 50%. Shorter, not quite as hard or shorter, maybe you do keep the intensity. You've got to know yourself. So if we use it appropriately, cortisol and adrenaline can be our best friends to help negate stress. But if we push too hard, it's like pushing on the accelerator of your car with no gas in it, you know, and you're pretty soon going to run out. And, and you know, um, just to use myself as an example, even yeah. the simple things can be um, too much. So my husband and I walk in the morning, two miles, two and a half miles every day. And it's my favorite part of the day. We walk early in the morning. It's still very green. The weather's beautiful where I live. And it's just part of what's become something that I, I really need every day. I, I, you know, I like that time and we don't overdo it. We don't push, we don't do any of that stuff, but it doesn't matter because I just realized a couple days ago, you know what? We're going to have to half this. So the past couple days, it's been half. It's been half and, and it wasn't a strenuous thing to begin with. So it's a whole mindset shift into the time that you put into it and, and what you don't need, you know, even though you feel like, like a lot of people feel like the endorphin rush and they, you need that sweat and you need that, you know, however long it took you. I still got a lot out of going a mile today. 
a whole lot. And it's hard to make yourself stop yeah. and do that. But using myself as an example, I just felt it. I knew I was like, you know what, you know, and what's the big deal? It's just a walk. It's not like I'm running, but I knew and I stopped and I did it. Well, that was such a crystal such clear way that you life. put it, Deborah. with the, it's, we have as thyroid patient, patients, we have a narrow, more narrow road to walk down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the thing that you point out, Dana, is really something we should hit on and that's the rest and recovery. You know, so if you're in the habit of doing the same thing every day, we, we are such creatures of habit that that can very easily become an addiction and, mm -hmm. you know, there's positive and negative addiction. So if you're in a habit in general, would that be a good habit to have? Yes. Right. But mm -hmm. There are also recovery days that we need to take into account. And we often don't, in fact, we're terrible. Women in general are terrible at resting, right? We, we just continue to create the to-do list. We add to them such that we'll never be able to ever finish them, right? The closer we get, the more we raise the bar, we add more things to it. And, and exercise is a little bit like that. We're competitive with ourselves, even probably if you don't think you are. If you walked two miles yesterday and you go for a walk today, you may very likely think, well, I need to do two miles again, at least that, or I'm going to have to go a little further, mm -hmm. right? It's like a drug, mm -hmm. right? It is. The same little shot is not going to do it for you. Yep. And so mm -hmm. you've got to be careful with that. So it's smart to learn how to plan and do some forethought so that maybe it's Sunday, you sit down and you're actually planning your week. So you've got days that are longer, days that are shorter, days that are more intense, days that are less intense, and you have days that are completely days off, meaning you might be active in your life, cleaning the house, you're, you're busy with mm -hmm. your kids, you're doing things, but not formally exercising. And that can lead to a much greater fitness level than just that routine of the treadmill over and over and over again. And just to add um, on top of that, I never really realized how active I was. It kind of made me feel good until I started tracking it. You know, I have a, a tracker now and good, bad, and different for me, it really helps with my sleep. And, you know, I've, uh, there's balance to everything, good and bad, but I do move a lot. And so it's okay. The days that you take off, like I do move you, you, I was just picking up the house. I wasn't cleaning the house. I was picking up the house. Mm -hmm. Took me 25 minutes. I moved. I had a lot of steps. I wasn't even right. planning that. So I was like, yeah, today's probably not a day I'm going to go for a walk. You know, like I got my movement yeah. in. It helps me realize, you know what? You're, it's not like you're sitting around on the couch. You're, you're doing stuff. So yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. There is a uh, fairly famous study, and maybe it's only famous because I talk about it all the time. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Ellen Langer out of Harvard did this study years ago before it was really popular. But it was all about the activity level of hotel maids and what they thought about the activity level. But it's true that cleaning. Cleaning hotel rooms all day, every day, apparently the average is eight rooms during a work day for a hotel maid to clean. That corresponds with this is adequate activity level for good health, for decreasing risk of disease and decreasing blood pressure, improving body composition, all the things, right, that we mm -hmm. want. But it was actually their thought process about what they were doing, just what you're getting from the tracker is the acknowledgement that, mm -hmm. oh yeah, you were more active than you thought you were. Because if you'll think back 50 and 100 years ago, we didn't have to exercise because lifestyle was active, right? Right. We just sit so much more. We have so much more automation. But the hotel maids were separated into two groups. One group was told, yes, you have to exercise. But they were also told what you do counts as exercise. And so the other group was told, yes, you should exercise. They were not told what they're doing already counts as exercise. Four weeks later, just four weeks, the group that was told what they're doing 
is enough to qualify for exercise, had improved their blood pressure, their cholesterol levels. They had lost more weight. They hadn't changed anything. Neither group had, except for the belief, the acknowledgement that what they're doing counted. So be sure that you, you know, Goosebumps. tune in to how active a person are. Right? Goosebumps. Yes. Um, that's incredible. incredible. Cool stuff. Yeah. Right? Mindful, wow. mindful exercise, but it doesn't have to be yoga, right? Yeah. Well, I've always said cleaning you. counts. Like it when does. we play thyroid 30, people say, oh, I didn't, you know, exercise today. Or And well, did you clean your house? Yes, cleaning yeah. counts. Absolutely. But you also apparently have to believe that. That's right. cleaning counts. Yes. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and not just your not it, cleaning your whole house. You cleaned your kitchen. I mean, because cleaning your house sounds like a whole lot, right? So cleaning your kitchen counts. Cleaning your bed yep. counts, right? Yeah. Can you talk to us about it? The- all adds up. It does. Every little <laughs> every little bit counts. So can you talk to us about the importance of strength training? This is something that you know, we always keep our ear to the ground and we're hearing more and more about the importance of strength training, especially as we age, especially for not just physical health, but mental health, things like that. What's, tell us about your view on strength training. Well, no accidents actually. So just last night I did a live with my tribe about 20 reasons why you should be strength training. And you know, among them is depression, anxiety are both reduced, cognitive skills are increased, meaning productivity, creativity, problem solving. And if you work with people, you're problem solving all the time, right? Um, but then there's, of course, the physical changes. So those are improved muscle improve bone. And why are those two the first two that I would mention? Number one, our muscle mass peaks at 25. And and then it's kind of like we start withdrawing from the bank unless we're doing something to stop those losses. So, and the, the only way to stop those losses is truly resistance training. So you may be a Zumba babe, you may love to run or to walk or to bike, but you cannot outrun or out Zumba muscle loss. You really have to be resistance training. Nothing has been shown to even compare. And why is, why do we want that? Well, strength, number one, and muscle endurance. And we don't think about it, unfortunately, until we start thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Until there's something you maybe haven't done for years that you go back and do and you think, I can't do that again. I can't do that now the way that I could then, that can be a problem. But when we're talking about what happens when you get to be 60 or 80, then we're talking about independence. But we are right now planting the seeds for what will be true of us at that point. You know, will we still be independent, be able to take care of ourselves? And um, my mom is now 93. So we're starting to see you know, no longer living in her own house. Now she doesn't drive. And, you know, trust me, I hear about that all the time because that's freedom, right? Can't go get my own groceries when I want to. I can't go to the library when I want to. And and so those things will become so much more important to us. So muscle strength is is huge, but it's also metabolism. So when you're thinking about right now, I'm not comfortable or happy with my weight, Strength training can actually be a huge help in helping you feel both a now and a later benefit, you know, getting the things that are important to you now. Even my mom, when she was 87, was concerned about her her belly fat. You know, she wanted me to show her core exercise and flatten her belly. So that's never going to end. And I'm okay with that, right? Whatever it is that gets you off the couch is fine because you're going to get the other benefits as well. But we need to hold on also to bone density. Mm. We start losing that at about age 30, unless we're doing something to keep it. So we are not probably going to be able to put more in the bank when it comes to bone density. We can add lean muscle tissue at any age. At 93, I think every retirement center should have to have strength training equipment in it. That's just my opinion. But we could gain muscle in our 90s. We can't gain bone in our 90s. All we're doing is slowing the losses and try to prevent it. 
we are all going to live so long that eventually we're all going to have osteoporosis. I mean, we just need to do everything we possibly can to put more bone in the bank while we're young and then hold on to it. And the best two ways to do that are strength training. No other exercise compares. None. Hmm. When you say strength training, I just want everybody to get that picture out of their mind of the guy with the huge set on his back and doing the squats where that is not what you're talking about, but it, it, it is, it's a misconception. You say strength training to the majority of the people out there and they are thinking that you're talking about this, you know, strength training, you know, these big, huge weights and stuff. And that is not at all what you're talking about. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Yeah, you bet. And so a couple of things, we're not talking about big, huge weights necessarily, but we are talking about reaching fatigue, Mm -hmm. but there are a couple ways to go about that. So we want to reach fatigue, meaning temporary fatigue, the last repetition that you can do with good form. You're starting to lose it or just to feel those muscles are shaking a little bit. That's called enough stimulus or overload so that on those rest days that we just talked about being so important, you actually gain the strength. So here's, here's something to sit with, and I'm going to say it and let you digest it. The exercise provides the opportunity for fitness, but fitness happens between exercise sessions mm. during the rest and recovery. So we've mm. got to be getting sleep. We've got to be just getting time off of that stimulus, adequate nutrition, adequate protein. Those things actually make you more fit between the stimulus that you got while you were exercising. So important to to realize that. So reach fatigue, you can do that with lighter weights more times, or you can do it with slightly heavier weights. We all need to progress to that point where we're talking heavier weights. So the next question you should ask, so I'll ask it, is going to be, what's heavy? What's heavy? What's the definition of that, right? So heavy is defined as as a weight you can lift 10 or fewer times. And that's more associated with improvements in bone density, improvements in metabolism. But some of us would potentially be saying, I don't want to get hurt or I don't want to add bulk. So let's address those. So in terms of getting hurt, no one would suggest that we start with a weight that heavy. So you want to start with something you can do 15 to 20 times or or even 20 to 25 if you're you're vulnerable and you've had an old injury or you know that you tend to get hurt every time you start because I know somebody's listening and that's them. Every time I start, you know, I get hurt. So let's start a little lighter, right? And keep listening to the muscles and what they're saying and the feedback in the days after you're done and then progress. And there may be a point where not every joint will let you go heavy and that's okay. Try to work as heavy as you can in the joints that'll allow you and otherwise just reach fatigue. That's the key. And when you say as heavy as you can, that may mean three pounds for some people, two pounds for some people. Exactly. I mean, it, yes. it's not this big, huge, you know, heavy thing for yes. some people. That's not what we're talking about. So you start where you can, where you can get your 20, 25 in at your one pound weight, if that's what it is, if it's two, whatever, and work your way up yeah. to wherever it is and works for you that feels comfortable where you can do 10 or less with that weight, right? Somewhere along That's that. right. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's exactly right. And just a couple distinctions to make between what will support muscle and what will support bone. Muscle will respond to both heavy weights and few repetitions or moderate or light weights for lots of repetitions. As long as you're reaching fatigue, you can see change. Bone, on the other hand, bone density doesn't benefit with lighter weight. So it does have to be heavy. So you've got to look at other lifestyle factors, potentially, if you can't go as heavy to support your holding on to that bone density. Okay. Good to know. Well, I am taking good notes here because I know that strength training is something that 
I definitely need to incorporate more. And for anybody listening, if you're looking for resources on this, Deborah has an amazing strength training routine that she created exclusively for thyroid refresh. Yeah. And also um, has an exciting new big program um, that is starting October 1st, the 12 week strength training program that you have coming out. So we're excited about that. Um, and we'll put the links to, to those things in the show notes for sure. Um, I'd love to, to dive into the injury factor a little bit because that seems like a big hurdle for me. One of my biggest challenges, how do I stay active without getting injured? And there are some things that I know are tied to Hashimoto's um, that maybe I didn't realize. Recently, I read about foot pain being tied to that. When I get out of bed in the morning, it my feet hurt pretty badly. And I've noticed, especially I'm in my early 40s, in the last three years, two years especially, I have to stretch my calves every day to relieve that mm -hmm. foot pain. Can you talk to us about that? Is that just... Is that common as we age, more foot pain? Such a great question. Yeah, and, and full of intuition. So it absolutely is related to hormonal changes that we go through, you know, and beginning with perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause. But a lot of women don't realize they're in perimenopause, but that'll be a sign and a symptom that potentially they are. They, they may not be experiencing hot flashes or night sweats, but other things are suggesting, you know, your hormones are changing right now. And that's one of them. So there's definitely a correlation. And I think we didn't realize this until the last five to 10 years. And the reason being is baby boomers went through and showed us there's enough statistics now because so many more women than men and so many women in middle age were exactly having that same type of problem. So plantar fasciitis is you know, what you're really referring to, or it's very like the signs and the symptoms that would be categorized. And I don't have the ability to diagnose, so I'm not overstepping boundaries. But if you're seeing a physician or you're consulting Dr. Google, chances are those things are going to fall under that category. So plantar fasciitis is just and itis is always a chronic condition. So it's chronic inflammation in the feet, in the fascia, which is, fascia is like you have muscles all over your body. It's like I would throw a hairnet onto your body. And it's that tissue that covers you that can get bound up and inflamed. And plantar fasciitis is really problematic. We can have, we can have tendonitis at the elbow or the shoulder any number of places, but where could it be worse potentially than where we need to be on it as our base of foundation that makes us walk around? That's really problematic. And it's why we're also so limited in our exercise selection when we've got a problem. So the, the easiest thing for people to do is to go walk, right? And, and yet a lot of things have to be eliminated if you've got foot issues like that. But what you explain can be very related to those hormone fluctuations. Now, unfortunately, we don't know exactly, we can't pinpoint which hormone is it, you know, and how do we support balance in that hormone so we can decrease it. But it's a reason to look much more carefully at what else are you doing? Potentially, can we reinforce good habits that you've got for, let's look at your sleep patterns, your sleep hygiene. Let's look at your nutrition a little bit more closely making sure you have a high nutrient density diet of the foods that you can tolerate. Let's look at your exercise and see, did you do too much too soon? Was there too much impact? Maybe there was too much incline. Maybe for you, the feet or the shoes that you were wearing were not as ideal and well-matched to your foot. So we each have a different foot. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but somewhere in the past, I'm sure I went to the shoe store and said, I want the pink ones, right? Instead of saying, <laughs> I need something based on whether I have a high arch, a low arch, or a flat foot, or a neutral arch, or whether I pronate or I supinate, and what activity I'm going to do. No, I just want the pink ones. <laughs> so we've got to be careful 
I'm asked that question a lot. So I know, you know, women are often asking, what's your favorite kind of shoe? And I said, well, it's not as easy as that. So what I think you're asking is what kind of shoe should I be buying? So here's the answer to that question, right? So really it is worth it to go to a good shoe store that will look at your foot and no shoes and know these are the kind you need. Because once you have that information, you'll have it. But women's feet change. So if you've gone through pregnancies, multiples, your feet have changed. And you may not have high arches anymore. You may have fallen arches. And all of that changes the need to really re-examine your footwear. So that's a big part of you know, looking at your health care, your foot care for a long period of time. But if you do have those issues with your foot, when you get out of bed in the morning or the middle of the night, for that matter, shoes beside your bed. So you always need to be in shoes. If you have flip-flops, even if I'm going to slip my shoe off, hold on. <laughs> even if they're built up like this, they're thick, throw them away. So backless shoes for anybody who's got a foot issue are the last thing that you want. So they make your foot actually contract twice and, mm. and you've already got some issues with your foot. So get rid of those flip flops go put them in the, in the garbage actually, because nobody at Goodwill needs them either. Right. So there are some things that just are not a good donation. <laughs> Don't pass that on. No. Right. Oh, wow. Oh, so informative. Yeah. I After I had my son, I had falling arches and I went to PT for it. And I would joke with my husband that I was learning to walk along with my son at age 36. Yes. And they really did train me how to walk again. So yeah, it's, but um, yeah, that was something that we kind of touched on before the show with just foot pain being a common thing. So thank you so much for enlightening yeah. us on that. Um, um, also, just really quick, I know we have to go, but I wanted to just ask you, is there a simple answer to this or not? Can you tell people about um, body weight exercises versus, you know, weight weights, you know, hand weights and that kind of thing? Is it good? Is it not? Does it compare? Is it totally different? Yep. At the risk of alienating some people. Okay. okay. I do have a, I have a firm line on this one. I, I think if your, your goal is metabolism and or bone density, there is no comparison between weights, actually externally added resistance in addition to your body weight. Great. And the, the biggest challenge with body weight for more women who are midlife and older is we've lived a great life, right? But we tend to, we've got some shoulder stuff or we've got some hip stuff or knee stuff. And that will begin to limit more so what you can do with your body weight. So if we're going to take care of all of our postural muscles, imagine Right now, if you're sitting and watching, we're all sitting here, but we have a camera on. So we're sitting with great posture. And I will tell you that if nobody was looking at me, pretty soon I would be rounded over, right? On my desk, round my keyboard, hugging that thing, right? <laughs> Five o'clock posture, I call that. And, you know, we all need pulling exercises so much more than we need pushing. It's difficult to do a pulling exercise with body weight unless you're doing a pull up. And how many of us can do a pull-up, right? So you can see the need to actually use dumbbells for pulling actions so that we can right ourselves. And this has a lot to do, by the way, with depression, right? Oh. So which comes first, the posture of depression or the depression? Mm -hmm. Actually, we, we think they come from both directions. We assume the posture and we kind of also assume the personality of a posture, they happen simultaneously. So when you go like this, you put the shoulders down, you feel a little bit more proud. You feel a little bit more confident, a little bit more energetic, and you actually create more room for a great deep breath that's going to help give you more energy. But for, for so many reasons, there are just too few things you can do with body weight that are not potentially injurious, and they're all, all forward. So yes. push-ups, right, mm -hmm. are... I'm going to tighten my chest and cause some more of that rounded overness 
again, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to, you know, cause some stress on my elbows and or my shoulders where potentially we already have some issues. Um, you know, there are exercises that can work and you can do that when you go on vacation occasionally, but it's just hard to get a really well-rounded workout from body weight alone. Great question. Thanks for asking that. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because it really did explain it in the, the way I wanted. So, okay. So personal question, can you do one pull up? I mean, can you do it? Can you do pull up? Can I? Yeah. <laughs> I can do them assisted. Can. Okay. Yeah. It's good to know yeah. because I have tried it recently yeah. and you know, you just feel like you can because I yeah. used to could. Yeah. So I'm right. going to work up to that. I'm going to work up to right. doing some assisted just like you. So do negatives. That's the key, right? right? So you get your chair, you get yourself up there and then you lower yourself lower down. down. Okay. So you can go with gravity, but you're putting the brakes on. So okay. you're getting stronger without having to do the full one. You'll get there. Okay. I've always felt like when I have been good about strength training, there is such that link to between the, the inner and outer uh, results, right? Like strong body, strong mind, the confidence that comes from being physically strong. So I loved what you said about the depression piece and the, you know, is it the chicken or the egg thing? So, um, and and just your whole you know approach is so it's so clear the message that staying active isn't just about looking good it's about feeling good and being well so living good and yeah. living well yes yeah. so um thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your shining your light on us today um one last question before we go what are your three main takeaways for the listeners today Definitely, if you're not strength training right now, start, right? Start looking at how do I start? Start small. And for anybody who's thinking that's limiting, I don't have time, you know, in 10 minutes, twice a week, you can get a high quality strength training workout that will begin to make some difference. And disclaimer, I, as a personal trainer, want you to be codependent, right? I want you to learn to love it and then you're going to want to do more. But if you start with 10 minutes twice, you'll be great. The second thing is be a critical thinker about every program that's available because there are strength training programs all over, but only 39% of all research in exercise and sports medicine features females. Make sure that the program that you're looking at is about research done on you, women in perimenopause, menopause, or postmenopause, or your age and your activity level. So it's got to be about you. And then last is, you know, assess yourself, you know, do some benchmarks, not just your weight and your body composition or your inches. And those are three things I also recommend, but look at how's your brain fog? How's your ability to focus? How many times have you laughed? What's your sleep quality and quantity? Look at your digestion, your elimination. Those are all signs and symptoms that will get better if you're exercising correctly, as well as, you know, give you feedback. I'm going in the right direction. Even if you're not perfect yet, you'll know you're on the path, maybe before the weight changes. Hmm. Perfect. Great tips. Yes. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Deborah. We so appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you both for having me. For our listeners, you can find Deborah Atkinson at flipping50.com. Thank you all for joining us for another episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, where we give you the inspiration and information you need to live thyroid healthy. To receive your free Thyroid Thrivers Grocery Guide, you can visit thyroidrefresh.com. And to learn more about Thyroid 30, our revolutionary 30-day wellness adventure, go to thyroidrefresh.com slash thyroid30. You do have the power to heal, and we have the tools. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to help us continue inspiring and empowering thyroid patients worldwide, please leave us a review on iTunes. It would make our day. I promise you are what makes this community the amazing resource that it is. And we so appreciate your listenership. 
and your support. We're Dana and Jenny wishing you the best of health. See you next time. 